And there, admiring the return of the Cup to Manchester United, my special guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, George Best. <laughs> Lance Percival set the scene rather nicely, May 1963, but why was it the time of your life? Well, the thing was, I'd been uh, in Manchester since I was 15, as, uh, you know, I'd left home in Belfast, and I'd gone through a sort of an apprenticeship period. I'd just had my 17th birthday, and that's when, uh, you know, the club usually decide whether to sign a player full-time professional. Mm. And of course, leading up to the cup final, they obviously had other things in their mind. So uh, at the time, I didn't really know whether I was going to stay at Manchester United or uh, whether I was going to go home to Belfast. And of course, it was a very important time for Manchester United, who was, who was still getting over the effects of Munich. Yeah, it was really. It was the start of some great years. Uh, the, the air crash obviously had taken away some tremendously great players from a great club side. And uh, Manchester United had become, it, in those days, if they weren't your team or the team that you supported, they were everyone's sort of second favourite team. Mm. And, uh, this really was the start of some tremendous years for them, so it was very important that they did win this trophy. And we have with us this evening two members of that victorious Manchester United team, Pat Querent and the captain, Noel Campbell. Well, he's already been honest and said that uh, probably the guys at Manchester United had a lot more on their minds than George Best. Do you remember anything of him at that time? I do. I remember him as a thin, spindly sort of a guy who had exceptional ability and just a bit too young to appear in the cup final. But I think most of us appreciated that he was, had exceptional skill and he was going to be a great player. But he was just about probably six months too early for it to play in our game. But uh, mm. he was only a kid. He, Drank lemonade and he behaved himself. <laughs> <laughs> he behaved himself he so much. He did what? Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. But probably orange squash and various <clears throat> things. I remember seeing him at the weekend. But at Manchester United, Noel at the time, particularly the young players, they were sort of held down by Matt, and they were all together, and we were the senior players at the time. But he soon emerged as somebody we were all very excited about. Mm. Pat, were you aware of this emergence? Yeah. Well, as I say, we all were, because his ability was, I mean, unbelievable at that time. And for a young boy and, you know... But I remember about the cup final, in actual fact, coming back from the game and him and John Fitzpatrick up at the window. But I remember one thing about it, because when the kids used to mix with the players then, Matt would maybe take one or two of them away somewhere and, you know, you'd get the kids round the table. Probably they'd never been in a big hotel in your life. And I remember asking them one day, do you want a prawn cocktail? No. We don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> George was quite a shy guy at the time. I, I don't think that many players, many people at the club, there were quite a lot of good, exciting young players there. And the thing he had more than anybody else, he had exceptional ability. But it takes more than just ability to be a great player. Mm. And I wasn't sure there's a question mark until people emerge and play in the first <clears> team. <throat> I've seen some great individual players with ability and never, never make it. Yeah. So... Um, I think we were, we were looking forward to him getting in the team and as soon as he got in, I don't think he ever was left out of the team other than when he ran away or something like that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we might care to comment about some of the uh, skills that we'll show you now. And best of beautiful football. This man is a genius. Best just with Stiles with him in the goal. And he's got a clear chance. And that's one it. Best is accepted by worshipping fans and professional experts alike as the most lavishly gifted player in Europe, if not in the world. So identifying with him requires rather a lot of imagination. His game is an amalgam of superb, almost unnatural balance, unbreakable spirit, a delicacy of touch that stays true no matter how fast he moves, limitless ingenuity and ambition, and force out of all proportion to his physique. He carries onto the field a constant threat of the incredible. Having seen that, I mean, the skills are obvious, but from the professional's point of view, what was so special about him? Well, I think um, it was his ability and his balance, and one didn't ever realise whether George was a right-footed player, left-footed player. And there's not many players in the world that you cannot identify. And he, he could drop his shoulder and go both ways. And he, 
Another thing one doesn't recognise when you're 16 is whether you're brave enough. And we've all seen him. And again, he's, a, he's one of the bravest players which people wouldn't even recognise. And I think his nerve was another thing that, you know, the bigger the game, that he's just a calmer. And mm. as a kid, as a young kid, when he played in cup ties and things like this, he was, he was a, under pressure, he was a great player. I, I really never got nervous before the games. I think because I, you know, the lads will tell you, I mean, 10, 15 minutes before the games, most of the time, they had to come yeah. looking for me. Mm. I used to be with my friends outside having a, a cup of tea. I remember the first game we ever played in the first team in actual fight was against West Bromwich Albion at Old Trafford. And he played against a lad called Graham Williams, who was a <laughs> big, strong left back, but a good footballer who played, who played for Wales. After Matt had told me, we were saying, this Stuart Williams is a big fella, and if he comes near you, he'll kick this out, you know. We tried to, but we didn't frighten him. It didn't make any difference to him at all at that time. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Because the 50s and the very smart styles were sort of battling with the beginnings of the swinging 60s. People were trying to get more casual and men were growing their hair a bit longer, including you. Mm -hmm. Did you ever boof on your hair? Ever sort of put it up at all? No. No, no well... No. <laughs> the, you look like a bit of an image of a Do you ever do that sort of dance? You know, funny enough, I've never danced in my life. And I... <laughs> uh, I'm glad I didn't after watching some of those. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, we must have been nuts in those days, yeah, yeah. To, to, go, to do some of those things. No, but it was great. I mean, the 60s, it was such an exciting time, you know, with the music and the, all the new dances coming out. It was terrific. Yeah. Well, of course, you got on the stage quite early. We got a lovely photograph of you, I think, at the age of... Uh, <laughs> ..of about 14 months there. <laughs> Not quite sure whether you got nappy trouble or whether you were trying to kick the ball there. <laughs> Family life, back home, how much were you encouraged to be? A sportsman? Um, very much so. Um, <clears throat> my mother was a, a very, very uh, good hockey player, field hockey. Mm. Uh, uh, my father played amateur football, and from what I gather, a few of his pals tell me he used to kick a little bit. So, yeah. <laughs> so there was that uh, sporting <coughs> side of it. And my father always was always at me to kick with both feet and you know practice and practice. Well, we uh, got him here to tell you off. Your father, <laughs> Dick Bass. <laughs> Did you spot that he was a natural footballer? Did you ever look at him and think, crumbs, he's something special? Yeah, well, I did think he had a lot of ability. In fact, most of my neighbours saw more of it than I did, actually. And I think a little thing that struck me was that he was so late that maybe he was a little bit too late. Although I knew he was a worry type and strong for what the He was quite him. frail, really, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was late. I wouldn't say he was frail, he was late, but sort of worry, you know. Seen more fat in the chip. <laughs> <laughs> but I use the word frail because that used to worry you in those early days, wasn't it? Oh, when I was a kid, you know, at school, all the girls used to make fun of me because I was so skinny. And it really got to me, you know, I, you know, it became a thing with me. You know, I, I think I was the only kid in, in the school, when it came to do uh, PT classes or phys any sort of physical education, I wanted to keep my vest on all the time because I was so embarrassed about my... <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that made it worse. The more I, you know, the more I did things like that, the more the girls took the mick out of me. Yeah. And it was always something that, <clears throat> because I know people that started to watch me, some scouts that started to watch me, and nothing seemed to come of it. And I always thought, you know, I, I, I was paranoid, but I thought it was because I was so skinny uh, and I was never going to put on weight. Mm. Yeah. But, of course, one man did spot you, Bob Bishop. Right, yeah. I, I mean, I, obviously, I didn't know, but apparently Bob Bishop, who was Manchester United's chief scout in Northern Ireland, had, uh, had been watching me. And, actually, I think they arranged a special match where he watched me and mm. uh, came to see the family one day and asked if I'd be interested in going. Do you remember that time when he came and yes, called? Yes. He came along with another lad from the, the Craig of Boys Club where George played. And they said, uh, would you be interested in letting George go to Manchester United? I thought, well, I mean, who wouldn't be? I said, well, if he wants to go, he goes of his own accord. So we called him off the street, actually. And I said, this man wants to know if you go to Manchester United. I think he didn't believe it, by the way. <laughs> but then they got it sorted out and off he went, done very well. Yes, he did do quite well, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and his early talents were spotted by a gentleman very famous in the game, Sir Matt Busby. He's the best player coming to football for a very long time. Not doing that, he's, he's, a, he's a fantastic, he's got a tremendous temperament. He's away from his ability and I have never seen a, I've never seen a player that can beat players so close. George, about this is a surprise to see me here, and it's an occasion which uh, I always recall. You're starting with Manchester United, 
and the way you started and the problems we had at that, that, that particular time. Our head scout in, in Northern Ireland at that time was Bob Bishop, and I believe he's still a scout here still. And he had been sort of recommending a little player, but more of an elf, uh, because he was so small and so light and, and, and light-footed anyway. And of course I come away and I felt, well, this is a boy we must get interested in, despite the size at the time. I'm afraid a week after it, I got the bad news came <laughs> that uh, George had decided I'm homesick, I want to go home. So I said, well, uh, there's nothing much more I can do, except, George, if you change your mind, do get in touch with me. Because I was very impressed with the, the, the skills that he showed. There was natural ability. Well, it went about 10 days, and of course I got a call from Dick, his father, Dick Best, his father, to say that George had changed his mind and would like to come back and have a second go. And from there, that was the start of the great best, one of the all-time greats. I'm sure he's, he will live in some of the things he'd done on the field. The natural ability he had will be something I will keep in my mind all the days of my life. Dick, uh, listening to that tribute from Sir Matt, has any of his antics since sort of uh, irritated you as a father? <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you ever tell him? I'll try to. Yeah. I used to think he did a lesson, but I think he did really. <laughs> At times. Yes, and I love the idea that you got this great opportunity of going to Manchester United and probably came back within 48 <laughs> hours, <laughs> along with this young gentleman, Eric McMordy. Uh, we were both very, very homesick. You know, yeah. As I said, never been away. And we, we talked to each other and decided between us that we'd had enough after <laughs> 24 hours. Well, of course, you conquered the homesickness. He didn't. He stayed in Northern Ireland, but he's here now. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Enter Eric McMordy. <laughs> Do you feel that was a, an opportunity missed? Yes, yes, definitely. I think um, I would regret that, regret what I did always in life. Yeah. Um, basically because I felt um, obviously envious of George and what he's achieved in life, but basically he had the opportunity of playing with so many good players who already you've seen just a few this evening. Mm. Um, so I think always I will um, regret not stopping at Manchester. But it was the most awful experience, quite honestly. <laughs> it really was frightening. Well, we're making it sound as if you haven't achieved anything, which is far from the truth, because you play for Middlesbrough, yes. and you've both played together for Northern Ireland. That's correct. What's he like to play with? Terrible. No, <laughs> quite yes. He means that because he doesn't get a kick <laughs> when I play with him. That's, that's, that's something I wanted to ask. Is he a truthful. selfish player? Do you ever think, oh, for goodness sake. Of course we did. Yeah, but the unfortunate thing was that what George would take on, um, he usually achieved, so you couldn't give him a good rollicking. <laughs> where other players would break down and obviously they got the verbal abuse of fellow professionals. Yeah. What are you doing now, Eric? Um, basically now we're involved in, we've got a business in Middlesbrough. I do a bit of uh, building for myself. I've got a general dealer's grocery shop. As little as possible, quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Thank you. I mentioned earlier your association with the pop world. I mean, you were called El Beatle by uh, one newspaper. Did you ever meet the Beatles? Um, yeah, I, uh, I know Ringo reasonably well. Well, while you were... <laughs> what first got you involved as a, as a little girl footballer? Well, I think I was rather a tomboy. Um, I used to go over the park and play with all the boys and they got their own team up and asked me to join in because they saw that I could play. Hmm. And um, it went on from there with the scouts and, and then at school, um, primary school. Um, I just carried on playing at school, really. Were they, were they kind to you or were they typical little boys and kicked you all over the place? Well, I think they're all right, really. They just treated me like, really, like a boy. You yeah. know, they went in with the shots, you know, and the kicks, and I got my fair size of bruises. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. And obviously you're very keen on uh, continuing the line. Uh, what, what point did you get involved, Lisa? 
just playing at school with really? the boys. Do you have a, a hero? Do you have a footballer you particularly admire? No, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> And what about you when, when you were playing at the age of 12 or whatever? I mean, did you have a hero in those days? Yes, I did. Jimmy Greaves. Jimmy Greaves? Yeah, family, <laughs> really. There's something in common. He was my hero as well. <laughs> he was? Greaves, yeah, tremendous. Yeah. Mm. Great player. And what do you feel about uh, ladies being involved in the sport? Funny enough, I've, you know, I've been living in America sort of most for the last seven years, really. And uh, there it is normal for the, the young girls to play along with the boys. I mean, I'm all for, you know, um, mixing of any sports, you know. Uh, I, I think as long as they're out there uh, running around enjoying themselves kicking the ball, it's a lot better than a lot of the other things they could be up to. Right. Know. We've got a special little <clears throat> present for you. Uh, a football, which has been signed by uh, all the footballers, including, of course, George, who have come on the programme. Okay. And one non-footballer, I've signed it as well. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Good luck with your career and uh, good luck with all the sports that you get involved Thank in. You. George, we mentioned earlier a, a tremendous disaster. I mean, the terror of Munich mm -hmm. lived on within Manchester United for a very long time. How aware were you when you were joining the club in 1963 of, of this sort of gloom hanging over? Well, I mean, it, as you said, it really was a, a terrible disaster because it, it's one of those things... Um, of course, the Kennedy assassination was in '63, mm. uh, and I remember what I was doing. And the, the sort of the Munich air crash was the same sort of thing. It was one of those terrible days in history that almost everyone remembers what they were doing. And of course, you know, it almost completely wiped out an unbelievably great side, mm. great talented side. Well, this is the way in which the newspeople covered the story of the Munich air crash. Munich Airport, and wreckage that tells the story of the dreadful disaster. Here's the story from two of the survivors, their goalie, Harry Gregg. Well, I was lucky I got out because my safety belt was broke and I cut down my hands and knees. Just as I got to the outside of the plane, I seen uh, Mr. a few of the boys hanging about, Peter here, and I called him to come back. I heard a kitty cry and it brought him to the senses. I lifted the kitty out and handed it to Peter. He took it away. Harry Gregg. I don't want to dwell on it too much um, because it's not part of what we're talking about in 1963 but uh, how much has the Munich thing hung over you? Well it's bound to have made a certain mark on my life but uh, thank God I lived through it I yeah. was able to survive it and help other people it was a tragic time for the country a tragic time for the club and a tragic time for journalism, because Britain at that time lost not only the great players, the great team, but they lost great journalists, which yeah. has been inclined to be forgotten over the years. Yeah. Well, let's move on to 1963, where you had every right, actually, to be a bit fed up, because you got dropped from that cup final team, didn't you? I believe over a period of about a month before that cup final, the boss, better known as Sir Matt, spent time hiding behind trees. That's how <laughs> fed up I was. Yes, I was very upset at being out in, in the final. Did this mean that you were maybe a little bit more aware of uh, this young gentleman's arrival on the scene? I had been aware of George prior to the cup final because one of my few injuries after it, I went to train with the young boys at the cliff. And in those days, I didn't like to be beaten and was inclined to chase people who beat me <laughs> and try and beat them physically. <laughs> and this kid came up to me, and in those days, I thought that I could throw dummies and make the guy give me the ball. And this young kid did it to me the first time, and I thought it's a mistake to don't do that to Greg. And did it again. <laughs> I'm very serious. It wasn't a mistake. It was the beginning of George Best. And uh, after a period of time, I spoke with the boss, and I said, have you seen the, the young kid from Belfast? He said, yes, the one with the blue eyes and the short hair. <laughs> and he said, it's a pity he's so small. That was the first notice I had of George. Mm. And what about the other way around? What, what was it like to play with the great Harry Gray? Well, I mean, ha Harry is, I mean, apart from the Munich Air Crash, is, is a big hero to a lot of people in Northern Ireland. Mm. They're very, very proud of him, as I am, coming from Northern Ireland. I mean, I'd be proud of him whether I came from Northern Ireland or not, but it just helps to the fact that he, yes. <laughs> you know, he was the Northern Ireland goalkeeper. I have, I have tremendous admiration for Harry. I think the world of him. Let's have a look at some of the skills that Harry spotted so early on at the training ground. Down with the free kick. Up as best is ball! Manchester United! Oh, 
Here comes Best again. What a player this boy is. He's got another. And Manchester United going to get number six. It's Best. Though calling for it on the right with that cheekiest of all cheeky little flicks by this supreme cheeky chappy George Best. You just said that last bit was absolutely brilliant. It seems to me, looking at that, and I don't think you're going to be the greatest soccer pundit in the world, the game is different now. You couldn't have a George Best in 1984. They don't play football today. They play a game called soccer, which is a completely different game. There's times I look at the game today and I think they're playing for throw-ins because they play across the pitch a lot of the teams I see. Mm. When we play, we played a game called football, where there were hammer throwers at centre-half, people that kicked you when tackling was allowed in the likes of George Best from the neck down. <laughs> Those things were part of our game where they do old adage, if he puts his head down, don't disappoint him. <laughs> <laughs> really and truly, that was part of the thing that the public came to see. But the last clip that it showed where George went through once, and he went from the 18-yard line past about four players, and he got himself in position almost in the byline, where a stupid player would shoot from a stupid angle. And George decided you don't score from the byline, so he actually dribbled the ball back through where he had come from and back heeled to a fellow mm. in a better position. You know, the players are coached today to the point where they're looking for intelligent players to understand systems. Now, there's a big difference. I agree with Harry there. If kids do that today, you see, at the end of that, uh, I lost the ball really because it didn't go to where I expected it to go. Uh, but if I'd have been today, someone would have clipped me across the ear for that, mm. for losing the ball and for holding on to it too long. In those days, no one told me off because they knew that eventually through my own teammates screaming at me and through experience I'd learn. And uh, I think, unfortunately, kids today are a little bit afraid to try things like that and do things that are a little bit different. Uh, I happen to believe it'll come back. You know, I hope it does because there just aren't any individuals left. Mm. Yeah. Will it come back, Harry? Will we see George Best in the, in the 1990s? <coughs> I pray to God it will. Ladies and gentlemen, Harry Gregg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the time of your life was May 1963, but my word, you've, you've been doing a lot of other things with your life since then. <laughs> I mean, you've hardly ever been out of the news. We've got some of the, the news headlines that you've been making. Best and girl in riddle of punch-up. George Best clobbered. I quit by George Best. Why I'm a bloody wreck. For the last year, all I have done is drink. Very honest comment, that. Uh, Jimmy Greaves has been very honest about his alcohol problems. Were yours as severe as his? Well, uh, yeah, I would think so. I, uh, I went through a terrible time. I mean, I said a year on that thing. I mean, it was, it was a lot longer than a year. Uh, I'm lucky in a way, you know, I realise uh, before it was too late what I was doing to myself. Uh, I really, I just couldn't handle all the, all the press and the publicity and the things that went with it. Um, and I tried to hide through, through alcohol and it just doesn't work. Mm. You know, and I got to a stage where I used to think that I couldn't do anything. You know, for instance, if, if someone had said to me, I'm going to sit and talk to you, uh, I'd go and have a drink, you know, because I thought I could talk more sense or I looked better or I, I acted better. And it got to a stage where I thought I couldn't do anything unless I'd had a couple of drinks, which is obviously, I mean, the biggest load of rubbish ever. Do you find that you've got regrets now? No. That's the, that's the, the, the nice thing about the whole, the whole period of my life. Uh, I don't regret any of it, uh, even the bad times, because I'm glad I've, I've had to see it, to waken up, so to speak. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm happy the way I've ended up. Uh, I have uh, a beautiful son, uh, you know, obviously, I think the world of. I, I retain my health. I'm very, very busy at the moment. I'm doing a tremendous amount of coaching and travelling all over the world playing exhibition games. And it's nice, I'm my own boss. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't had a drink for almost a year. And, and the longer it goes, the less I feel like it. And uh, so I tend to look at myself as how I've ended up. I could have been a hell of a lot worse off. And uh, I was fortunate because, I mean, first of all, the year that we're talking about, I had 10 great years. And I, was, I just feel fortunate I was around at that time. 
are you ever aware of the amount that people are frustrated by the fact that somehow they almost feel a bit cheated about you, that you, mm -hmm. you never realise the full potential. I mean, when I said to various friends, oh, we're going to do a show with George Best, to a man, they all said, oh, if only. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a tremendous, I mean, your next book ought to be almost, if only. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, actually. I mean, my friends say the same to me. You know, as not only as friends, but I suppose as football fans. Mm. They say the same thing, you know, we only had 11 years, you know, and it should have been maybe almost twice that. Uh, but it wasn't to be, you know, and I can understand their point of view because I'm the same when I see great players getting towards the end. Uh, I mean, I shortened it, you know, myself uh, through various reasons, but I feel cheated when I see players like Jimmy Greaves and, say, Jim Baxter and uh, players like that uh, having to quit because I admire them tremendously and I want to see them go on forever. Mm. But it, it's just not to be, and uh, I feel sorry for them, you're right. I mean, <laughs> my friends, when they said to me it should have gone on forever, I, I wish it had it done, but, it, you know, it didn't. And as I say, I tend to look at myself. I'm happy with the way I've ended up. Good. Thank you for the memories. Thank you for the honesty. Ladies and gentlemen, George Best.